welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to this week's show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. I hope all is well with each of you as we work our way through this battle with the coronavirus and that you are safe. It is mid-April, and hopefully at this time next month, a good portion of the country will be slowly returning to normal, our new normal, whatever that is, but it will at least be the next step in our national recovery. As we all know, the sports world is at a standstill. Major League Baseball is working on a plan to open the season for everyone down in Arizona, eventually hoping to move games back to home cities at some point. We don't know if that's even going to happen, though. There are still so many unknowns on every level in the sports world. For college football fans, we have no idea what will happen next. It might be June or July before we have a clear picture as to what kind of football season we will have if we have one. For Michigan basketball, it has been a disappointing week. Joining me on our game day segment to discuss that and more, including football, is beat writer Orion Sang from the Detroit Free Press. Here on the Michigan Man, in partnership with our friends at SB Nation's Maize and Brew. So stay with us. Here with us on our game day segment this week is Orion Sang from the Detroit Free Press. It's uh, It's been a while, Orion. Great to have you back on the show with us. Good to be back. How you doing, Mike? I'm not doing too badly, as we were talking about uh, before taping. It's a, a little bit tricky to come up with stories, but really, uh, you know, overall, it, it's been busy in the last couple of weeks, hasn't it, with a lot of recruiting news? Yeah, and especially the past 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. A lot of stuff has been happening. A well, lot. Now let's start by talking about that because it's been disappointing to say the least for Michigan basketball. And let's start with the Josh Christopher thing. Uh, you know, in the recruiting world, most recruiting services were, you know, I think pretty unanimous in the last uh, month or two months, even longer, that he was coming to Michigan. But then on Monday night, he picked Arizona State. And I guess proving once again, you have no idea sometimes what's going on inside a 17 year old's head, do you? From what I was told recently, Michigan, you know, was a little nervous, but they felt confident. They were optimistic about the prospects of landing Josh Christopher. Obviously, he would have been a huge piece for next season's roster. I mean, they they need a guy like him in the backcourt. It it would have been a huge victory for Juwan on the recruiting trail, too. It would have proven that, hey, look, I'm I'm dipping my toes into the one-and-done waters, and, you know, it's actually paying off. Obviously, recruiting is fluid, so however Michigan felt about him, things didn't play out that way. So... As we saw last night, he's going to Arizona State, and, and that leaves Michigan in a tough spot here, I think. Doesn't his brother play at Arizona State already, though? Yeah, his bro- older brother Caleb, was, uh, he was a freshman there this past season. Family's family, so uh, I can see why Juwan and staff might have been a little nervous uh, down the home stretch there, but it's done with. He's going to Arizona State. The other news, uh, and we're taping on uh, Tuesday evening, came out earlier today. Isaiah Todd decommitting, and I know there had been some rumbling in the last few weeks that Michigan was getting nervous about him, but his decision to go pro or play overseas, that somewhat surprised me. I think there's always a chance that he would have done that because I think those thoughts were prevalent even back when he did commit to Michigan in the fall. You know, they were hoping to sign him, obviously. Um, they, they were getting the paperwork ready to send to him. Signing period starts tomorrow, April 15th. So so the news packed that tightly, but, you know, in the span of 12 hours, um, 11.30 Monday night, Christopher picks ASU, and then 11.50, uh, Tuesday morning, Isaiah Todd picks uh, going pro. Those two blows, I mean, that's that's a whammy. It's a double whammy for Michigan basketball right there. But I, I want to break down how that affects next season's team because I'm not entirely sure that uh, Isaiah Todd's decision is as impactful as, as Josh Christopher's. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you would prefer to have a McDonald's All-American of Todd's caliber on the roster. But if you look at Michigan's roster composition right now, they might be all right in the front court. I wrote this today. Like it, it really depends on Isaiah Livers. If they get Livers back, you know he'll be the starting four. You've got Brandon Johns who can play the four and and, and play a little bit at the five. So Todd, who I see mostly as a four, 
I, I think that having him on the roster would have been great, but it also would have been like the five-star cherry on top of the ice cream Sunday, I guess. You know, just because Michigan was already pretty loaded at the forward position. I think they can get by there. I think they might be okay. Obviously, if Isaiah Lillard decides to stay in the draft, it's a whole different conversation. But if he comes back, then it will be okay. The, the other side of it is that when you look at the backcourt, I'm not sure how they're going to be able to replace the, the potential production that Christopher would have provided. I think he's one of the elite prospects in the 2020 class. He's one of the top scorers. He's really athletic. He's got a great first stop. He's explosive. He can get to the rim. He can score in transition, and, and he can create for teammates, too. When you look at the current roster right now, they've got guys like Eli Brooks and, and Mike Smith, who are, who are good college players, but you're not really necessarily sure if they can provide the scoring punch that uh, Josh Christopher would have provided. And the way I see it right now is that you've got the one in the two spots, the point guard and the shooting guard spots, and you've got Eli Brooks, Mike Smith, Zeb Jackson, Cole Bajeron, Adrian Nunez. Those are your scholarship guys at those two spots. You've got to find three or four guys to give you minutes. I would bank on Brooks playing 30-plus minutes, just like he did this past season. And then, you know, you're going to see Mike Smith be counted upon. Zeb Jackson's going to have a chance. And then, obviously, Bajeron and Nunez, if they both return, you know, they'll have a shot too. But they're going to have to have some of those guys step up here without Christopher in the fold. Getting back to Isaiah Livers for a moment, I mean, I know he's testing the waters, but as far as I understand it, there are no personal tryouts. We know that there's not going to be a combine. So how is it that he's going to make a determination or his people or NBA teams as to whether he's going to get drafted? That's a big question. I mean, obviously he'll get feedback. He applied to the undergraduate advisory council committee the problem is we're unsure if the normal pre-draft process will continue with the workouts or or teams you know get players into their facilities and and let them practice and and shoot and play pick up against other prospects we don't know if the nba combine will still be held that's the biggest deal it's in chicago every year well has been the past couple years And, and that's a huge deal for you know scouting you know they run you through it's basically like the nba's version of the nfl combine it's a big deal yeah. i don't know if that's going to happen you know and, and if that doesn't happen how are they going to be able to evaluate guys like isaiah livers you know who, who might be on that fringe of getting drafted they're going to have to look at game tape and, and go off what they already know it, it hurts guys like isaiah livers who maybe would have had a chance to impress in person and, and increase their stock but now, you know, with the current outbreak and, and pandemic, maybe they won't get the opportunity to, to do that. Well, you mentioned Mike Smith uh, transferring over from Columbia, and I have to admit, I don't know much of anything about Mike Smith. It seems like, you know, analysts and writers from around the country think that was a really good get for Michigan. But where does he fit in on this team? I think he fits in as a, as a point guard. I think there would have been a natural fit with him maybe playing that third guard role that David Julius played this past season. If Michigan had landed Josh Christopher. Now I think there's a chance that he could be a starting point guard, you know, depending on how ready Zeb Jackson is. I think there's a very real chance that the starting backcourt in the first game of the season is uh, Mike Smith and Eli Brooks. Smith, like you mentioned, scored a lot of buckets in the Ivy League, but the thing that you always want to watch with uh, graduate transfers is, is how the level of competition, that step up, how that affects them. And, and he's going from playing against Harvard and Yale to playing against Michigan State and and Ohio State so it's going to be a drastic step up and obviously some some graduate chancers are able to handle that better than others so we'll see which category he falls upon but I mean he can create his own shot and I think Michigan needs guys who can do that so I, I think it's a positive addition for sure. Well with Colin Castleton and David DeJulius entering the transfer portal and now we as we've learned in the last 24 hours lost uh, Josh Christopher and Isaiah Todd I'm sort of losing track of scholarships right now. Do we still have one or more to give? Yeah, so they have two open scholarships now currently. If they had Jace Howard on scholarship, they'd have one open scholarship. But as it stands right now, they have two open scholarships. So, you know, they could pursue another grad transfer if someone, you know, they're interested in comes open. They can try to sign someone else in a 2020 class. There's a variety of options and directions they can go in. They could even pursue a sit-out transfer. That might be... That might be helpful. And I'm saying that because when you look at next season's scholarship situation, you know, they have a lot of scholarships open. I think they have like six or seven. That might be five. I I have to, I have to go look at it exactly, but there's going to be a lot of scholarships open. So, I mean, if you take a sit out transfer, a guy who can maybe, you know, he won't play this year. He won't be able to help you this year, but, but he can help you next season. I mean, that, that could help them. Well, when you look at what's happened, uh, Orion, in the last 24 hours, losing um, a five-star in Josh Christopher, and then I think uh, Isaiah Todd was a four-star. 
you know, we're recruiting five-star guys, high-level guys, something the Coach B never did. And I know a lot of people today were messaging me saying, see, this is why Coach B didn't go after these guys. I don't know that that's valid. But, you know, it does get more hit or miss with these kids when you concentrate on these really elite five-level guys, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think something that I generally follow when I'm looking at recruiting is that you're never going to be able to hit on all of your targets. And it goes for any sport, you know, unless you're like Ohio State or Alabama or Clemson in football. But that's an aside. You're never going to be able to hit on all of your top targets, but you need to be able to, to have backup options, backup plans. And and I think you saw that this, this cycle. I, I think Michigan prioritized Walker Kessler at center early on, and he went to North Carolina. They still ended up with Hunter Dickinson. They really liked Lance Ware. You know, he picked Kentucky, and, and they got a four in Terrence Williams later on. And, and now you look at, okay, Josh Christopher and Isaiah Todd are gone, so what, what's your contingency plans? It's a little tougher now because the cycle is basically over. Mm-hmm. The offseason has been going on for a while. But, you know, I'm sure they have some idea of where they want to go next. It's all about having your plan B, your plan C lined up and ready to go in case you can't execute plan A. I think that's a big deal in recruiting. So I think, you know, from what you've seen, I think I think you had to consider his first cycle recruiting, Juwan Howard. I think you have to consider his success still. He, he landed some high-quality prospects who had big offers. He still has a number one class in the Big Ten. Although the Big Ten isn't the greatest recruiting conference, but his first year, I don't think it's I don't think it's bad. You know, it could have been better, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I think overall it was a positive. Yeah, and I know people are disappointed uh, with what's happened losing these two kids. But as of right now, the roster is well pretty much set. Who knows what will happen uh, in the next uh, couple of months? But with the current roster, when you look at it, Orion, do you see Michigan now as constituted as a top five Big Ten team heading into next season? It's tough to say because we're waiting on so much. You know, we're, for Michigan's perspective, we're waiting on Isaiah Livers. I think he's a full crumb of the lineup. Obviously, my my opinion would change if he stays in the draft. And then you look around the Big Ten, you've got Luca Garza, who entered the draft. You've got someone uh, like Io at uh, Illinois, who hasn't announced his intentions yet, and he could enter the draft. Maybe he'll come back. And there's just a lot of moving pieces around the Big Ten right now, so it's hard to say. I will say, on paper... I do think that what Michigan is projected to have on a roster next season, I think that group is probably less talented than the group that they had this past season. Don't get me wrong, it's still really talented, but this past season, you know, you had Xavier Simpson and John Teske starting at the one and the five. Multi year starters, guys who won a lot of games. And and now you're looking at, you know, replacing them with, with potentially a grad transfer who's coming from the Ivy League and then maybe a freshman at center or or someone who's the backup center this past season behind Teske. So I think when when you're just looking at the subtractions and, and additions at the one and five spots in the lineup, I'm, I'm not sure if I can say that this next season's team is better on paper than the past season's team. Another interesting story from uh, Tuesday was uh, Amani Bates from Ipsy Lincoln was named the uh, the Gatorade National Player of the Year, and we know that Jawan watched him play this year, and I don't think last year uh, Michigan was paying too, or the year before I should say was paying much attention to him. But is Michigan really on him now? Yeah, but I mean, there's always a question of whether he will even play college basketball. I've seen his class could be the first class to to go from prep to pro if the rule is changed. Obviously, it remains to be seen whether that rule will be changed in time. But that's been that 2022 class has long been pointed at as the potential first class to be able to go back. To, to going from high school to the NBA directly. And I think he's good enough to do it. So that's the big question. You know, is he is he even going to want to play college basketball if that option is open to him? And until then, I think it's just smart to recruit him. Like like Michigan State and Michigan have done. You know, they're they're watching his games, showing up, and, and uh, letting themselves be seen, be present. So it's never a bad idea when, when you have someone like that talented in, in your backyard. No, you've got to pay some attention to him. Uh, you know, I really haven't been able to see him play, but it's amazing. I know Michigan State's been in on him for a long time, and everything you had read uh, up until this year was that if he was going anywhere, it was probably going to be Michigan State. But you're right. It does not hurt for Jawan Howard and his staff to uh, to recruit on him, even if he uh, – is only going to play a couple of years. You'd still love to have him. He's, he's a really good prospect. You might as well just uh, show up to his games, continue to talk to him until you get definitive word that he's not yeah. playing in college. Until then, you know, why not? Here is on our game day segment this week is Ryan Sang from the Detroit Free Press talking a little Michigan hoops. And now we're going to switch gears and talk some uh, football for a couple of minutes. Recruiting is really the only thing happening on the uh, the college football scene. 
And the last few weeks have been pretty good for Jim Harbaugh and his staff overall, haven't they, Orion? Yeah, not bad. They've had a, a solid collection of, of prospects, commitments. I, th- I believe six commitments since this whole thing started, which is a lot. I'm looking at the list now. Um, they got a, a tight end, Lewis Hansen. They got a center, Raheem Anderson, offensive guard, Greg Crippen, linebacker uh, from Massachusetts, defensive end punter. Yeah, so they, they, they've gotten a lot of prospects since this whole thing started. And I think the interesting to me, interesting thing to me is that uh, I was talking to the high school coach of Greg Crippen and the high school coach of uh, Raheem Anderson, and they both think that those guys can play center. And obviously only one center can play at a time. So, you know, maybe one of them will play guard in Michigan and, and the other will play center. I don't know. But they've got two guys who can move around a little bit on the interior of the offensive line in Anderson and Crippen. I talked to Hanson's head coach. Uh, he thinks Hanson is a uh, really really good at going up in the air and snagging balls he, he likes the way he uh attacks the ball in the air and he also says that Hanson has improved a lot as a blocker i think those guys are uh pretty important to have in college you want you don't want a guy who can only be a receiver or a guy who can only be a blocker you want those versatile tight ends who can do both he was a pretty nice addition and and the other guys i've seen some some stuff from them and they seem like they're capable players too so obviously it's a recruiting is a little weird right now because they're in a dead period so they're landing these commitments without having these guys come on campus. They're they're getting these commitments virtually over the phone, over video teleconference or whatever. It's an interesting time we're in. You know, the last time I looked, Michigan was rated, maybe that was before this week, but they were rated the 15th best class uh, in college football and on most of the recruiting sites, I should say, sixth in the Big Ten, which I know that gets a lot of my listeners fired up because uh, a lot of your readers, a lot of our listeners, they are... 24-7 uh, on uh, college recruiting. They follow it all year, every day. And a lot of them are getting a little nervous. But wouldn't you say it's too early in the cycle to be too alarmed by these numbers? Yeah, I mean, they're up to 10 in the nation right now, which is, I mean, that's that's pretty good. I, obviously, you'd probably want to see the cycle play out a little bit more, probably until the end before making a judgment call on whether, you know, this was a success or, or failure recruiting-wise. And there's still a long way to go. I think the, the thing that will be interesting is if, the the season happens i'm going to assume it does just so i can explain the scenario if the, if the season does happen i think that uh those game day visits are going to be very crucial to mm-hmm. to how this class ends up because just with, with just with um this whole pandemic going on right now kids aren't really able to visit anywhere and they haven't been for a month now and you're gonna and those kids are going to want to see their their future schools their future potential landing spots which means that there's going to be a ton of visits in the fall i think Michigan, like any other school, is going to have to knock it out of the park in regards to these game day visits, these official visits. Well, and the good news is that Michigan is still in on a lot of big-time talent, and uh, even better, plenty of it is right here in our backyard, isn't it, Orion? There's a couple of top prospects in, in the state of Michigan that I think they're going to be the subject of some pretty heavily contested recruiting battles. So Donovan Edwards, the running back from Bloomfield, and, and uh, Rocco Spindler, the offensive lineman from Clarkson. I think a lot of different schools have come after them. I'm not entirely sure where Michigan sits in those recruitments. It seems like those might be more drawn-out processes that, that go through the fall. Like Those are probably the recruitments that I'm referring to. You know, Top kids aren't going to feel like they're in any pressure to commit now just because schools will hold spots for them. So, so they're probably going to just wait it out until the fall so they can take official visits or whenever they can take official visits. So those visits are going to be key whenever they can start up again. Yeah, and a couple of those kids, uh, you add them into the mix, you're going to bump up maybe to a top five class with uh, a couple more kids like that. Yeah, yeah. They could sign a, a top five to top ten class. I think it's totally possible. They've got a pretty good foundation. You know, they already have a five-star quarterback committed, you know, a bunch of four-stars. It's a solid foundation for a, a top five, top ten recruiting class. Well, a burning question for... All sports fans now is, uh, will there be any sports this year? And uh, as we mentioned before you and I started taping, Monday, Chris Fowler from ESPN echoed what, you know, we've been hearing from a lot of media and medical experts that everything is really up in the air and, and college football could even be moved to spring. And we talked about this too, but that is so hard to imagine, isn't it? Yeah, I I don't know. I honestly, I don't know if it'll even happen and i don't know if it did happen what they would do you know how they would adjust um everything is just so up in the air right now this is something we've never seen before obviously and and it's just hard to to say or or even venture a guess as to what was what's going to happen with college football you know obviously 
we're all hoping that it happens. It just seems all very uncertain right now. Well, I know last week Jim Harbaugh said he was uh, remaining optimistic uh, that there was going to be a college football season. He said he had to be. And also last week, Ward Manuel was on uh, with John Jansen on the, uh, the the podcast In the Trenches. And, and Ward basically said he they're working on really four plans. College football season starting on time. College football season starting a little bit late. Not playing in front of a crowd or maybe even going to spring plans a b c and d basically they have all they have the athletic directors a lot on their plates right now don't they they do yeah they've got to figure out you know how they're going to account for the spring athletes who decide to come back for another year um they got to figure out how to potentially account for not having football revenue in the case that the football season doesn't happen i mean there's a lot on their minds i i don't envy it i saw cincinnati uh permanently shut down their soccer team today i think you might see similar moves occur across the country this could affect you know a lot of a lot of schools a lot of athletic departments financially it's gonna be tough no absolutely i know old dominion dropped wrestling last week and i think as much as the 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 big revenue sports fans watch college football and realize how much money it brings into fund all the other programs these non-revenue sports have to be very nervous right now i don't want to speculate but it does seem like the possibility of a football season not happening is going to be very very dangerous for a lot of these smaller non-revenue sports across the country. There's a lot of bigger athletic departments that you'd be surprised to find, you know, maybe are struggling with their finances. So I don't think it'd just be smaller schools cutting these non-revenue sports. I think you'd see, um, you know, power five schools have to have to do this as well. It's going to be tough. No, it is going to be tough. And you're right. It's not just, you know, you know uh, mid-sized schools or small schools struggling with this. The big ones are too. And Right now, there's a lot of attention being paid to uh, ticket renewals all across the country. And I was reading last week that Auburn has said they're basically going to run ticket renewals right up to if the season starts in September and then just sell game by game. And right now, Alabama is at something like 20% renewal, and they're going to extend Ward Manual and Michigan fan. I think Michigan's is May 15th right now, and Ward said he was very open to moving that it just goes to tell you when you especially when you look at the numbers from like an alabama with their avid fan base how freaked out people are by this that's that's a good question i mean a lot i i'm not really sure i have the the means or knowledge to answer that i'd say a lot of people are freaked out though that's the best i can put it you know it's just uncharted waters you know even if the college football season starts on time, one of the fascinating things to me and to all of us, I think, is going to be how does that impact how many empty seats we see? Yeah, I think I think you could see this linger throughout society, you know, like movie theaters, uh, restaurants, you know, concerts. I think people will generally be wary of, of attending these things, going to these things, participating in these activities until, you know, there's a widespread vaccine, which we might not see for quite some time. That's just my opinion. You know, that's just my opinion. Well, a final question for you, uh, Orion, before we let you go. And uh, we sort of talked about this before we started taping, but uh, I'd like to ask all of my guests, all the beat writers and broadcasters this question recently, because uh, I know how hard it is to do one podcast a week. And for you guys that have to put together content and stories been pretty good in the last week or two but it has been tough to get content out on a daily basis hasn't it yeah it's been tough we've had a lot of stuff happen this week and you know there's a steady stream of uh, football commitments that, that helps with that too but uh we definitely got to get creative you know there's a stretch when i was calling up a bunch of olympic athletes just to talk about what was going on with uh the olympics postponement and how they reacted to that uh so yeah i mean for writers I think all of us would say that it's an interesting time. Uh, we're hoping that we can keep our jobs because the industry is not doing that great right now. And just crossing our fingers and, and hoping that the sports that we cover will, will return at some point soon. Here with us on our game day segment this week, talking Michigan hoops and Michigan football has been Orion Sang from the Detroit Free Press. And uh, as always, Orion, it's a pleasure having you on the show. And we just uh, want you to be safe, and we hope that the next time that we talk to you uh, uh, down the road, we actually have some uh, positive things to talk about and maybe a, a start date for football. Hopefully. All about to you, Mike. Thanks to Orion Sang from the Detroit Free Press for being our guest today. On next week's show, we'll have recruiting guru Steve Lorenz from 24-7 Sports with an update on how we're doing with the class of 2021. Remember, our free show app is available from the Google and iTunes stores. You can also hear us on Spreaker, Radio.com, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher. 
Wherever you get the show from, please rate or comment on the program. It really does help us a lot. I would also like to hear your maize and blue thoughts on any topic. So email me anytime at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's it for this week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, be safe, take care, and go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!